kwenda mukamino ah kwenda mukamino ah kwenda mukamino ye kwenda mukamino no murembe kuno murembe to kwenda mukamino no murembe kuno murembe to kwenda mukamino no murembe to 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 kwenda mukamino no murembe to no murembe to no murembe to kwenda mukamino no murembe to no murembe to no murembe to kwenda mukamino no murembe to Good afternoon. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Welcome. I'll compete against that good music for a minute or two until we can. Great. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, all. It's just gone three o'clock. Um, South African, Central African time. Um, welcome very much to, um, we can go, just go back to that previous slide, please. Welcome everybody to, um, to our uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, my name is Henny Bester. Um, I'm a technical director with Senfri. I'm speaking to you out of the south of the continent. Um, it's a pleasure to have all of you with us these this afternoon as we're going to discuss some of the fascinating questions on how different countries on our continent have different capabilities to respond to, um, to what has become one of the most significant events in, 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 in all of our, I think all of our lives and certainly of our economies. Um, just as far as the housekeeping um, rules are concerned, these are normal. Um, these are normal Zoom rules, webinar rules. We've all become very conversant with them. Um, so, <clears throat> um, please um, use our chat function for any questions. Also, to indicate your organisations, um, as you indicate, the participants' video is disabled. You know the raising of the hand function. There will be a good Q and A function. Um, and towards the end, we'll um, create quite a bit of time to discuss the, um, the framework. And in the meantime, please use the chat um, liberally. Um, this afternoon, um, if we can go to the next slide, please. This afternoon, we have um, an excellent panel to assist us to, um, to deal with this question um, um, from... Um, from the Overseas um, Development Institute, we have Judith Tyson, who's a financial sector and a capital markets expert. I'll introduce Judith a bit more later. Um, from the very eastern corner of the continent, we have Hopestone Chavula, who's with the UN Commission for Africa. Um, right in the center of the continent, we've got John Bosco Iyaku, who's a Director of Programs with um, Access to Finance Rwanda. And then sitting out of Johannesburg, um, we've got Herman Singh, who is the CEO of Future Advisory and has extensive experience, particularly on digital businesses across our continent. Um, and then um, I'll introduce Christine shortly, who's going to, to present um, our framework for us. Um, so I think that one of the really challenging things for all of us, I think, that are on this call over the past almost five months, I think, if you think back to March and February this year, when people didn't even use the word COVID-19 yet. Um, but over this time, I think all of us has have wrestled in some way or another with the question, what does it mean for us as individuals? What does it mean for our families? What does it mean for our countries, our businesses? Um, and one thing I think that's, that's really true throughout of this is that it means different things for different people, for different businesses and different countries. Um, and a lot of how the pandemic is playing out and will play out over the next few years has to do with these underlying drivers. One of our challenges at Century has been, well, how can we at least get a credible framework to understand um, how this works. Um, 
And that framework we've been working on for a few months and we've recently put it out there. And today is a wonderful opportunity for us with the team here um, assembled, all who come from different constituencies and angles to really investigate, probe a little bit what this means. Um, now, let's start um, with, um, with Christine Hoogaard. Now, Christine Hoogaard is a technical director at Senfree. She's been with um, the, the company for a long time. She's an incisive analyst, um, and she's been looking at this together with our internal team. And she's come up with a framework that we think is really interesting. Um, and I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. I'm going to let Christine speak to us now. Um, so Christine, over to you. Take us through this, and then we'll um, continue with the panel. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Annie, and good afternoon. Um, Brana, you can move to the next slide, please. I think just to pick up what Annie has said, um, I know everybody of you who follows the press um, will agree that much has been written about the likely impact of the pandemic on the economic landscape, the impact we're already experiencing that's likely to ripple out um, even further and really wiping away years of gain in, in poverty reduction. And um, that generates a very clear imperative for policymakers and the development community um, who are tasked to respond. They wield the tools at their disposal um, to mitigate the impacts on the short term, to get the economy to recover on the, in the medium term, but then also importantly for longer term adaptation to this new normal, this new post-COVID-19 world um, that we're faced with. As Yeni said, there really will be no one-size-fits-all solution. And different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are impacted in different ways. So when we started to grapple with this question, we really um, thought that understanding the options and implications in the face of, you know, how do you respond to the economic um, impact asks for a nuanced view that is really informed by country context. So we developed a framework that I'll be presenting today and that we really want to position as a, as a heuristic, as an input for debate to map and cluster countries in Sub-Saharan Africa in a way that helps us to think through how the impact of the pandemic and response options will pan out differently in different contexts. Uh, next slide, please. So just to introduce you to the um, dimensions for our framework, and when I say framework, what we did is, is to map different countries according to these three dimensions. The first is um, external vulnerability. And for that, um, we think it's very important to understand the susceptibility of the economy to changes in the global economy. So we're using the current account position exogenous driver um, of the economic implications as a proxy for that. But because this is such a global crisis, it's very important to understand the extent to which the integration with the global economy um, impacts um, a country. The second dimension, which we call fiscal leeway, looking at government's ability to access lending to respond to the crisis. So the fiscal space or, or breathing room that they have, so to speak, um, and for this, we consider the cost of raising debt internationally, given the risk of default as a proxy, and I'll explain that uh, more just now. Um, then the third dimension that we considered is then the ability of the economy to respond. So if there's your external sector um, uh, vulnerabilities, there's the fiscal space, um, how will your domestic economy react to whatever um, response measures are implemented? There we're looking at the competitiveness of the private sector, but we're also recognizing that the private sector is only part of the picture. So it's also important not to only look at the formal sector, sorry, but also at the informal sector, because the resilience of people operating in the informal sector is equally important. And um, in many countries may actually serve to some extent as a mitigator um, of the impact of the pandemic. So if we look at those um, three dimensions and we then plot 
please uh, across those as I'll show in the slides to come. We come up with four uh, clusters of countries across which we then compare the likely implications and uh, that sets us then up with the parameters for policy responses. So we dub these clusters in terms of the options that they have in the face strengths or parameters that's placed by these three dimensions. Um, and I want you to pick up on the color coding of the four bubbles um, in on this slide because we'll pick up on that again in the coming slides. Um, the, the limited option, baby blue, the light blue, we refer to them as externally hamstrung. I'll explain why just now. The light blue, which will be the countries that we uh, dub some leeway, and then the green is what we call the room for manure. Thank you. We're getting the next slide, please. Right, so on this slide, we um, plot countries um, for which we had data across the first two dimensions. So on the y-axis or the vertical access, you'll see that we use the current account balance for 2019 as a percentage of GDP. So it's important to know this is now the snapshot picture pre-pandemic and we want to understand how vulnerable or susceptible um, the country is to the implications to follow. On the horizontal axis, um, we're plotting um, the rating-based default spread for 2020. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's basically uh, the premium that the country needs to pay to access um, capital finance on the international bond market based on um, the default risk to that country. So it's an imputed um, indicator um, drawn from a country's sovereign risk rating, which um, again, you know, as at the back end, um, uh, a lot of factors that determine that. So on the horizontal axis, I really want you to read um, Let's just go back to the, to the main view, please. Thank you. On the horizontal axis, I really want you to read that, that fiscal space um, and the ability to, to raise funding. Now, it's very interesting to see how the clusters are starting to emerge, even if we just look at these initial um, two dimensions. So the navy blue ones, oh, and by the way, the sizes of the bubbles represent population size. So the navy blue ones towards right or at the bottom of the graph are what we uh, dub the limited options um, countries. They either have very little ability to access um, funding on the open market and in fact most of these countries will not access um, uh, the international bond markets but will be dependent on multilateral funding or they have a very weak current account position um, if you look at Mozambique right there at the bottom or a combination of both. So it's really the countries to the, to the right and to the bottom um, of the diagram. Next, I want to draw your attention to the middle band where we've got the bright blue more towards the top um, and the light blue more towards the bottom. These are countries that have um, some access to capital at a, the, the, at a slightly lower um, spread than those in the limited options. Um, and the, the difference here really comes in in terms of their current account position, so how susceptible they are to the um, external sector. And in here, things like uh, the role of tourism, the role of businesses, overseas development as, uh, assistance, uh, commodity export dependence, uh, import dependence, all of that obviously plays into your, your vertical axis. So here, what we call the externally hamstrung are the few countries in this middle band that are more towards the bottom. So that has a, quite a weak current account position leading into the pandemic. Um, and what we call the sum, they are um, the majority of the blue um, bubbles that are more towards the top. So they've got a similar fiscal space, slightly better um, current account position. And here, as you'll see later, the individual country context and um, the features of the um, domestic private sector and sector will really make a difference in terms of how it pans out. Towards the left, you'll see a couple of green countries centered around um, South Africa. We term them the room for maneuver because they are compared to the rest of our sample really in the 
best position in terms of um, space um, as well as a relatively balanced um, current account position. We also included some comparative countries internationally. Just out of interest, I can also detect um, the validity of our clustering. Uh, so we included the likes of India, Mexico and Brazil from the G20 and it was interesting to see that they do cluster more or less um, with South Africa um, in, the, in the more sort of room for maneuver um, uh, categorization. Then we also have your large economies of the UK, the USA and China, which um, uh, unsurprisingly um, are your zero rated risk, risk spread. So very good access to um, cheaper capital um, globally um, and a relatively good current account position, even a surplus um, for China. Brianna, please move on. So as I said, the previous slide showed you the snapshot picture before the onset um, of the pandemic. Now it's very interesting to see um, on this slide, we try to bring in a bit of a dynamic picture. So if you follow the shaded um, arrows, it shows you what is the projected change in the current account position for 2020. Um, and what is very interesting is that a lot of the countries you'll say, see, for example, um, Angola um, with its oil dependence, um, Rwanda with tourism and coffee, etc., is expected to see a large drop in its current account position, taking some countries out of the um, some leeway externally hamstrung position and even some countries out of the um, externally hamstrung into the limited limited options. And this really just shows you that the effect of a pandemic on this, on this scale in terms of the impact on, on global markets. Interesting to note is that the green ones are expected to see some improvement in the current account position. For us in South Africa, it's no surprise that our exports would be more competitive on the back of the large depreciation that we saw, but also the reduced uh, domestic demand um, feeding through into, into imports. Next slide, please. So up to now, we've considered the first two dimensions, namely the external sector vulnerability and the, and the fiscal space. And it showed us, or it started to show up that countries cluster into different groups. So it's very interesting we also consider now the third um, dimension, namely the ability of the economy um, to respond, to see that um, our cluster pattern still holds. So on this graph what you see is um, the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Index rankings. So it's a country ranking out of 141. Um, not surprisingly, your large economies um, uh, in the comparison countries are best ranked globally. Um, and then we find our um, G20 comparison countries and the, what we call the Room for Maneuver countries um, as having the best uh, domestic or, or private sector competitiveness ranking out of our sample. And then towards the right, you've got the navy blue ones, so the, the most vulnerable um, cluster tending to be in the least um, competitive category. But I think what's interesting to note is that there's quite a spread of the different shades of blue throughout the moderate to, to low um, competitiveness um, rankings, which brings up the fact that it will really be dependent on the structure of an individual country's economy um, and the sector competition in that economy that will determine much of um, how this recovery and adaptation path will pan out. Um, and the first two dimensions should not be seen as sort of predetermining the path because a lot rides on the specific country context for competitiveness. Next slide, please. The last um, dimension, or actually the, the, the second part of the ability to respond dimension, is then to consider the role of the informal sector. Because as I said, the formal sector um, accounts for no more than half, actually less than half of GDP in most countries across Sub-Saharan Africa. To um, make sense, uh, uh, to get a little bit more uh, difference and nuance across countries, we then just looking at the percentage of GDP, 
um, we looked at ILO data on the percentage of inf informal sector employment as a share of total employment in the country. Um, not surprisingly, in most of the countries um, in our sample, the data was available for, it is 80%, 90% plus of people in that economy earn their livelihood, not in the formal sector, but in the informal sector, which subsistence or smallholder agriculture um, forms a big part. So again, it's interesting to see that um, it's only the green countries, the, which we call the room for maneuver, um, where uh, the formal sector has, relatively speaking, a lot larger proportion of employment um, compared to the other countries. And again, um, the, the shades of blue then have quite a high consistency in terms of very, very high informal sector um, reliance. And I think that really places a lot of the discussion that will follow um, in perspective. So it's always important to keep the resilience of the informal sector in mind when thinking about specific policy options. Thank you. Next slide, please. The final slide thing is just a summary and we'll leave this up during the panel discussion as well to say what is the what is the upshot and what does this tell us about the response parameters. So in terms of the limited options cluster which really represents um, the bulk of countries in the sample we see that the exogenous factors drive a lot of the um, economic impact. And also for the few countries that are in the externally hamstrung um, group, it's really exogenous factors rather than endogenous that plays a, a, a large role. When you get to some leeway, there's a bit less external um, sector vulnerability and the same for room for maneuver. There's, there's a stronger um, uh, domestic uh, sector and, 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 and a bigger um, private sector that's able to, um, to, to respond and also for long-term adaptation. Um, all the countries have quite limited access to international capital markets, definitely most so for the limited options who um, many of them have already received a multilateral funding in the face of the pandemic. Um, in the middle uh, clusters, we've got access at, at moderate, moderate levels and towards the green cluster, um, it starts getting a, a little bit better in terms of the fiscal space. Um, in all the countries, we see that the informal sector is very important in terms of resilience. Um, when we come to the leeway and to some extent the externally hamstrung um, clusters, we see, see that private sector competitiveness really differs by country and you would need to take into account the sector composition. Um, and then as I for the room for maneuver cluster, it's a di more diversified economy um, with um, more sort of private sector um, resilience that can be factored in. So if we think about, you know, what now? Um, how do you respond? We see five key parameters that we think will determine the response choice uh, across the clusters. And we're deliberately not making any recommendations here. I think this is the purpose of our panel today to talk about the different, um, different options. But we do think that firstly your objectives and time frame set a parameter for how you will respond. So are you interested in short-term mitigation? Do you want to drive the recovery the next two to three years or are you already seeing this as an opportunity to pivot the economy for longer term um, adaptation so what is the objective secondly what are the levers at your disposal if you're a government you may um, want to uh, implement fiscal stimulus measures uh, you may have sector specific industrial policy uh, most immediately humanitarian support uh, donor uh, partners may want to implement value chain digitalization or build digital skills um, to help with this pivot of the economy towards a more digital state. Um, so that is your second response parameter, thinking about what levers you have. Third, obviously um, important is the sector focus. So is it the informal sector resilience and the supply chains to the informal sector that you want to keep active? Or are you focusing in on specific um, formal sectors? Um, maybe the financial sector. Is Are you focusing on the Part of the private sector um, serving the foreign market or the domestic market. 
Um, fourth parameter is the constraints. So the position on the plotting and these dimensions that I talked you through now obviously sets constraints for the likely impact uh, in which you um, determine your response. But there will also be a number of context-specific um, constraints, including the institutional strength, the level of corruption, the economic structure, the existing extent of digitalization in the economy. Uh, and then lastly, we think it's important to also consider what are the funding options. So as I indicated in the fiscal space, uh, property, foreign versus local debt, multilateral funding, overseas development assistance, remittances, those are all sources of funding to draw on um, as you respond to the impact of the pandemic. And on that note, I think over to you and I think let's get the panel discussion going. Great, thanks Christine for that. Um, and, um, and thank you very much to, um, to our team who's been administering the polls that's been running. Um, thank you for your responses to those. It's probing questions. Um, yeah, so we see that, that there are really three core dimensions here that we believe will drive the maneuver that countries have. It's their exposure to the external sector, and we all know that, that global demand and supply chains have changed radically in the past few months. It's their ability to raise finance, therefore their fiscal space, and just that inherent resilience of the economy both the, 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 the formal sector and the informal sector. So to just reflect on that, firstly, we have John Bosco Iaku. He um, sits in Kigali. Um, I've known him for a number of years. He's the director of programs at Access Finance Rwanda. He's held a number of positions in the private sector in Rwanda, amongst other at KCP Bank. He was the CEO of the Business Development Center for Rwanda. Iaku, Rwanda, as in our categorization is in, um, is in the sort of second grouping of, of countries. So you'd expect it to be in a relatively weak position, but that doesn't seem to be how the country has responded. We've seen a very robust response, um, um, even though the tourism sector, which is a very big um, um, source of income for, for Rwanda, is obviously dramatically curtailed. Um, so we've seen a government that's quite resilient. Um, what do you think have given them this, this edge in the current environment? And, and, and what are the responses which they're pursuing? Thank you, Annie. Uh, that's a very important question, is exactly in terms of uh, response to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I, I wanted, before I dive into uh, the... Uh, the response of uh, policymakers in Rwanda. I, I wanted to showcase really what matters in responding to a crisis. I, I think really what matters is, I mean, any, any government or any institution should be able uh, to collect and disseminate information uh, because I mean, you need to be having information and that information which is accurate will help you to, to put in place uh, better policies in terms of response, but also uh, providing a timely response. I think that has been uh, uh, demonstrated uh, by Rwanda uh, when the first case uh, uh, came into the country on, on 14th March. Uh, I mean, after one, one week, uh, the, the government put the entire nation under lockdown, which was very prudent uh, and well thought kind of uh, solution. The other aspect which is key is really to put in place an efficient coordination mechanism, but also a monitoring and uh, evaluation framework uh, that really helps you uh, quickly adjust based on uh, prevailing conditions or outcomes from what is happening in the market. So that's, that's, that's the kind of uh, framework that we've been working in uh, in, in, this, uh, in this country. So I, I would frame Rwanda's response as really a timely and well thought out response and coordination. So that, that has played a big role. Now, uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, I mean, you, you, when you look at pre-COVID, uh, just a few months before, 
Rwanda was performing very well, uh, nearly uh, reaching a double-digit growth. Uh, I mean, it was the, the end of 2019. Uh, and indeed, uh, the recent publications show that we, uh, 2019, 2019 was a great performance I mean, in terms of GDP growth, 9.4%. So, but all that really, uh, I mean, yes, you can have a very robust and strong economy, but most importantly, what matters in responding to a crisis is really uh, the quality, uh, the trust, and credibility of government and public institutions. And I think that's what we, we, we are enjoying in Rwanda, and that was critical. And this, when you look at it, facilitates enforcement of measures and the quick recovery process that we have seen uh, in this country. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's very important. Now, in terms of policy actions, um, yes, indeed, we, are, we, we have that uh, foreign sector exposure. Um, you look at the coverage of imports uh, by exports. Really, it has been improving over time. Um, I, I recall that, I mean, it was close to 30% in 2013. Now, we are close to 43% in 2019, which has been really, I mean, improving. But, but I think and I believe uh, more efforts are still needed to reduce the trade balance deficit that is there. Now, um, and this has, uh, I mean, looking at the projections by IMF, I mean, we, we had uh, a current account deficit of 10% 2019, and it's projected that it will, I mean, it will go over 16% 2020 uh, if, if, if the pandemic, I mean, based even on the effect that we have for the pandemic. Now, what have we done really in terms of foreign sector or, or foreign exposure? Uh, the first thing was, I mean, as you highlighted in the report, most African countries uh, have a large informal sector. And in Rwanda, we are close to 94%. Now, that 94% really helped a lot in terms of continue providing essential goods to the nation. Uh, and because most of the informal sector is, is really into uh, agriculture, that was very important that uh, uh, people continue getting the essential needs. Uh, we, 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 we have both agriculture and manufacturing sector that are really dependent on imported inputs. And, and that was critical. So we had a disruption uh, in terms of uh, uh, the supply chain, uh, because we are landlocked, we need to go through neighboring countries. And that was a critical issue that the government has had to address. So we had to really to sign different protocols with uh, Tanzania, just to ensure that inputs continue coming in so that uh, the agriculture sector can continue functioning, but also some es essential inputs for the manufacturing sector continue being provided. And, and that was, was what was done. Uh, and, and so, I mean, we are encouraging domestic production to ensure that in the future, we can cope with any pandemic that comes. I, I'll stop there so that uh, really we continue the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, um, Yaku. Um, Herman Singh is, is the CEO of Future Advisory and has behind him really an illustrious career in sort of digitalization, if I can put it that way. He was with, um, with, with Standard Bank as their director of e-commerce and online services, um, and sort of more recently with MTN as the managing exec executive of their e-commerce um, space. Um, so this whole drive that we are seen by the pandemic to um, much more digital business models. It's been his stock and trade, his breakfast, his lunch, and his dinner for a long time. Um, Herman, you know, the, the private sector response is a really interesting one. What does this framework say for the private sector? Um, yeah, over to you. Thanks, Henny. Look, I, I think what's clear is that um, the private sector is heavily dependent on the consumer, and the consumer, of course, um, the economy cannot improve until the consumers do. And consumers, unfortunately, have to recover physically and mentally. In other words, they may not be dying or getting sick, but mentally they believe that it's dangerous to leave their home. 
And so what, what you're seeing, I think, is a massive loss of um, the disposable income. And so a big swing towards, as you've heard, essential products and services, and also a move towards value products um, rather than, I guess, di discretionary products. Um, I'm doing some work now in the fashion industry. The fashion industry across Africa has collapsed by something like 30 to 40 percent. So huge collapses in things that are not essential. At the same time, there's lots of unemployment. So you, you're seeing a big move towards informal sector where people who were previously employed are now becoming are now joining the informal sector. Uh, um, if one looks across um, sectors, it's clear that not all the sectors are hit the same way. So the telecom sector generally has gone up. Most telcos are doing better. Mobile money is flying across Africa. But the restaurant business, uh, in fact, there's a view that half of all the restaurants that closed down won't open up again. So they're gone. Uh, mining industry has been heavily hit by exports because the countries like China are not, are not importing. Uh, you know, and the travel and entertainment in industries toast. The luggage industry, by the way, if, if you go up the value chain, the luggage industry then gets damaged because the, the uh, travel industry is damaged. Uh, the advertising industry is gone because people don't have money to spend. And banks are now starting to release their results. And it's very clear they've been severely hampered by a decline in borrowings and uh, the non-performing loan books looking terrible. So, so generally banks are, I mean, the private sector is in trouble, uh, but not all businesses are in trouble to the same extent. Um, clearly that there's no or minimal government support. It's not like America or, or Europe where there's a lot of money being pumped in by the government. Governments really have got no ammo here. And so the one thing that you're seeing is, is the big downsizing, loss of jobs, and um, corporates are definitely looking at ways to try to eliminate debt, especially dollar-denominated debt. Um, and some companies are better positioned to maneuver than others because obviously they came into this recession in a good position. So those that were in a good position now are being, becoming the consolidators. They're starting to take over the weaker companies who've got a bigger uh, debt book. There's definitely going to be a lot more rights issues because we've got to raise more, more capital and drive down the debt to equity ratio. And it's very clear that, that funding for startups, for example, has evaporated quite sig significantly, which has hurt that sector and which is a, a, a real shame. Um, so, so organizations that, that export, for example, apparel, fashion, beauty, even mining products, they, they are really struggling now because the countries that were on the, on the receiving end of this are just not buying anymore. And of course, the supply chains are, are hurt quite badly. Um, across Africa, I guess, South Africa is suffering particularly hard because we, we went into the lockdown probably one of the earliest in the world, and we probably had some of the most severe lockdown conditions. So that's hurt South, South Africa particularly hard. Um, if one looks across at the informal sector, as I said, I think the informal sector is relatively well placed because of the fact that they are serving essential products. They're heavily hurt by the inability to, to obtain product due to supply chain dis disruptions. But it's important to bear in mind that a lot of the economy these days is really services oriented and it's less material intensive. And so what's starting to happen is services that were previously manual are now becoming more remote. They're now starting to use more digital channels. You're starting to see a lot more telephone service, conversational service, chat service, mobile apps, etc. And so what was previously transported will in the future be transmitted. And so you can see this huge and increasing dependence on the internet and in particular in Africa, the, the mobile companies. So I, I think it's a mixed bag for Africa in terms of the impact on the, on the formal sector, but I do expect to see a period of consolidation, uh, uh, definitely a thinning down of the, of the debt levels, capex, opex, and a move towards more low touch, um, if, um, low touch services. But we can talk more, more about that later as we, as we go. Right. Um. Thanks a lot, um, Herman. Obstin Chavula is, is an economic affairs officer with the UN Economic Commission for Africa in Addis. Um, he's in their macroeconomic policy division. Um, and I've been, I've been fascinated in, in listening to Hope Stone on, um, on how early on they at the Commission for Africa identified the importance of that horizontal access the fiscal space for governments as they have to respond. Um, and Hopestone has been studying that for quite a while. Um, yeah, Hopestone, your um, impressions of how African countries are going to fare given the dynamics of their ability to borrow or not. Over to you. 
Helps to, yep, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Henny. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for inviting us to this panel. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, this is a, a good work, good framework. Uh, there have been a lot of thoughts behind it. And actually, it covers uh, almost all the main aspects that I might look at when you are trying to look at the sources of vulnerability. As you might be aware, ECA was one of the institutions that uh, had the, to, to assess the, the, the envisaged compact or impact of COVID-19 on the African continent. So at ECA, we look not only at Sub-Saharan Africa, but all the figures we present, they represent the whole of the continent uh, based on uh, our political affiliations. So, if I look at the, the sources of vulnerability that have been captured in the framework, which are well covered, it's only a matter of maybe presentation that might be different. I would say that the literature you indicate that maybe mostly looks at the three different sources of vulnerability. Uh, you look at the size of the exogenous shock. Uh, for, for us, you see that in the first phase uh, when COVID-19 uh, uh, came into effect in China, our first assessment was actually what is the, what would be the impact on African countries because we, we, we didn't think it could reach the extent it has reached now. So we looked at the connection between African countries and, the, and China and they look to what extent that would have impacted on the African economies. Uh, then uh, later on it extended to Europe, then ended into Africa. That leads me to the second component in the sources of vulnerability. You see that uh, uh, the second one will be the country's exposure to the shock itself, which uh, mainly deals with uh, the linkages, if we talk of externally, the linkages that, uh, how strong the linkages are between African countries and their trading partners. If we look internally, we could look at actually the size of the population, population density, uh, and how scattered the population is within each and every country. That actually will necessitate uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 and the, the, end, the, the, the coming up of the economic shocks. Then thirdly, we could look at the uh, capacity to cope, which is uh, actually something that you are looking at the resilience of, of these particular economies. Uh, one that if you note that uh, the, the COVID-19 has exposed the weaknesses within the health systems. Uh, only the African continent significantly, and also uh, the narrow fiscal space uh, for African countries to breathe in terms of health spending. You notice that the COVID has uh, shown it evidently how weak our economies are in, in that particular extent. And uh, to, to, to that extent, furthermore, uh, all those have uh, actually have actually uh, been exacerbated by the vulnerabilities due to the impact of uh, the variability of commodity prices on the global market, uh, which most of the African countries are dependent on, as well as the decline in the global demand, especially pertaining to, to, to Africa's uh, trading partners in this particular case. Uh, in terms of uh, the view on the fiscal space, as uh, some colleagues have indicated earlier on and even in the presentation, it has been indicated very well of the, the situation before COVID came in. Let me emphasize that uh, before COVID, you notice that uh, most African countries uh, had very high fiscal deficits. On top, they, on top of that, they had very high debt to GDP ratios. On top of that, they had very high costs of borrowing related also uh, Telling the story about their payments, uh, debt repayments uh, to the material institutions as well as uh, some of the developed countries. So at that moment when the COVID-19 was coming in, the fiscal space was already stretched. And uh, the coming of uh, COVID-19 has actually uh, made the, the situation worse uh, in the sense that uh, there has been a significant drop in the export revenues, which has been mostly the source of these countries' revenues. And uh, it means countries will basically have significant challenges in uh, repaying their debts. On top of that, uh, combined with that, with the decline of uh, the commodity prices, that uh, 
commodity prices and both with the demand making things even worse for most of the countries. Uh, so our assessment in this regard, the first report that we came up with uh, flagged out these particular uh, instances. And uh, we made the estimates as uh, to how much African countries would need actually to bounce back to the, uh, maybe to the levels they were uh, in the pre-COVID COVID stage. And uh, we estimated that uh, uh, that was our, by our April estimates, uh, it was about more than a uh, hundred billion dollars that the countries would need uh, to get back actually to, 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 to the normal, normal, normal situation before, before COVID. That being the case, uh, that led to the, to the convening of the finance ministers. You might have heard or seen on TV where ECA actually called together all the finance ministers in Africa. To, to discuss about these issues and uh, forge the way forward. And uh, one of the ways, actually, one of the most important things that came out was the need for, for, for debt forgiveness. Debt relief is one of the significant issues that came out of that. Uh, but uh, doing that, uh, there was a discussion that it could have, uh, it could come in different forms. So ECA actually championed what we call the DSSI, the Debt Standstill Initiative. This Debt Standstill Initiative is an initiative whereby countries will be allowed, are actually being allowed. Now it's about 43 countries that have registered to that. These countries have actually been allowed to, to stay without debt repayments up to the end of this year. So that uh, the, the, the funds that could be saved out of that could actually be used into these countries' productive save productive sectors, as well as some as the health expenditure uh, to combat the economic effects of, of COVID-19. Um, on top of that, we also looked at uh, how governance would play a role in this particular, in this particular case. As you, might, uh, as you might know, on the African continent, uh, issues of corruption are at a very uh, high, high, high stage. And uh, we actually, in our modeling work, we incorporated what would be the impact of, 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 of the, the, the government stance in terms of uh, the sound governance structures uh, in an economy. So if we have uh, a poor government governance structures, they do exist in countries, what would be the impact? Especially this is in relation to the funding that uh, might be coming, that uh, they might be coming from the different multilateral institutions in terms of usage. So we discovered that uh, if to the to the worst case scenario, you discover that uh, most of the African countries might lose up to up to two percent of their GDPs as a result of not having efficient and effective government structures uh, in this particular in this particular case. Uh, having said that, you will notice that uh, most of the countries actually during this process when they are getting these uh, this funding from multilateral institutions, they have put in place mechanisms uh, that actually are helping uh, in combating such kind of, of issues. And uh, for example, in Kenya, you notice that uh, the digital technologies actually have played a significant role uh, in safeguarding, in monitoring the usage and the, and the, and the targeting of these particular, uh, particular funding, funding initiatives in these countries. Uh, for the moment, Thanks. let me stop. Yeah. Let Thanks. Me know if, that's, that's an interesting perspective much. that the the absence of good governance may actually result in the multilateral aid hurting rather than helping in this time. Um, thanks so much. Um, Judith Dyson is with the Overseas Development Institute in the United Kingdom. She's a specialist in finance for development and particularly financial sector, financial market development. Um, private investment, financial macroeconomics. Um, and for today, Judith really has, I think, very interesting perspectives on how all of this will transmit through the financial sector and what the impact of that will be. So Judith, um, thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you very much to, to, the, uh, to Christine and the other presenters uh, for some very interesting comments. Um, I thought 
just pick up on a couple of points. One is to uh, talk a little bit about the, the situation with the domestic banking sector and how that might interact with um, some of the recessionary forces that we're seeing. And then um, I thought I might just make a quick comment uh, on following on from Hope Stone's comments around uh, debt forgiveness, particularly in the euro bond market. Um, it, uh, of course, one of the issues we're also seeing at the moment is around data. Um, and many of the data sources that we would normally uh, use around to see what's happening in the banking sector, of course, are, are not timely enough right now for us to get a great picture. Uh, but we are, have seen various um, different bodies doing uh, you know, brief surveys and, and, of course, some of the banks, uh, the major banks in Africa are also making announcements. And the picture is fairly consistent about what is happening in the banking sector, uh, which is, unsurprisingly, we're seeing a surge in uh, non-performing debts. Um, and we're also seeing significant difficulties in managing uh, bad debts as they arise because of course there's a curtailment of uh, banking staff's ability to go out meet with clients chase up debts and so on um, it's you know it, it's diff you know the deepest concern and the worst case that we would see would of course be a full-blown uh, financial crisis in the region with you know uh, uh, significant collapses of institutions I think though at the moment what we're seeing is that is not likely to happen but what we are likely to see is a credit crunch which is to say you know sharp contraction in lending as banks um, seek to rebuild their capital and liquidity positions and to manage down the bad debts that they the, the the sort of wall of bad debts that we're seeing coming up and that really means that the banking sector is not going to support a uh, recovery uh, for some time until that process of uh, cleaning up the balance sheets of banks is finished and is likely to add to recessionary forces um, now, um, I think there's a couple of things we can add to that as well. One is that we're seeing uh, these problems across the full range of institutions. So at uh, some of the big uh, national and regional banks, uh, but we're also seeing it in second tier banking institutions and in microfinance institutions. And I suspect if we saw the data in informal, number, uh, informal financial um, organisations of various types as well. So there's really no uh, kind of escape from the squeeze of lending. Um, Christine mentioned earlier, you know, the importance of the informal sector and of course at the bottom end of that tier uh, in sort of microfinance or orientated institutions in those categories, we're likely to see that affecting um, the livelihoods of those at the, at the bottom of the pyramid as well, unfortunately. Um, in, um, Maybe we can just add um, a little bit to, uh, so we've got a little bit of time for questions about the, um, the issues about indebtedness. Um, you know, Hope Stone mentioned, um, you know, and, and Christy mentioned the situation which going into this crisis, has, you know, there's already been um, uh, stress in terms of debt sustainability and fiscal, uh, fiscal positions. Um, and there's been quite a lot of talk about the euro bond markets. And we saw Christine showing us, um, you know, the movements um, in spreads, which are really kind of giving us a, a, a good look on where international markets are seeing the risk um, in, risk for regional names. Um, and um, as Hope Stone also mentioned, there have been calls, including from Africa, but also from many of the multilateral institutions uh, for debt forgiveness. Now, personally, I think that the outlook for that for private debt, which of course is predominantly euro bonds, is, is poor um, and possibly uh, unrealistic. Of course, this is a situation with, uh, you know, donor um, uh, debt that they have a dual mandate in terms of supporting poverty and uh, economic prosperity in the region. But unfortunately, private investors, uh, international private investors don't. And of course, they're accountable to their investors and their shareholders. And I think it is very likely, unless the situation gets a lot worse, that they would consider debt forgiveness. And I think this is quite a big issue for uh, Africa because elsewhere particularly in Asia and in Latin America in recent years we've seen um, uh, situations which have become very difficult where private investors have pressurized governments to reach um, agreements and so we've seen things like seizure of uh, you know some of the best uh, uh, public assets um, so uh, for example in Sri Lanka where we saw them seizing airports and um, uh, and uh, the ports in the capital uh, in, you know as a, as a way to restructure debt um, and of course um, in places like Mozambique where we've seen private investors looking to get um, security on future commodity revenues and flows in, in the oil and gas industries and I suspect we will see a situation like that today uh, going forward as well so um, sorry that's a bit of a, a gloomy uh, comment but I, I do think we also need to be realistic and think about how to put a floor under the situation that might arise uh, in Africa in relation to dealing with pressure from private investors. 
Um, the one good piece of good news on that, though, is that uh, the majority of debt that is outstanding is not uh, due in the short term. Uh, most of it comes uh, due in about three or four years' time, so there is some time uh, for economies to recover and maybe to be able to address um, their needs to um, refinance that, those debts in due course. Um, uh, Henry, let me stop there, and then because maybe we can ask some of the audience for questions or comments. Absolutely. Thanks, Judith. Um, Thank you. So we've we've got about four minutes to the hour. Um, I'm going to try and manage this so that we have ten minutes for Q and A, and then we'll close. So we'll run over by five minutes. Um, and please insert your questions in the um, in the chat room. Um, and, and, and then um, we'll handle them there. Um, while we um, digesting the chat room questions, uh, the big question obviously is, what do we do for the future? Because listening to you, Judith, um, there's not gonna be a much of debt, for, a lot of debt forgiveness on the private sector side. Governments don't have a lot of room to maneuver. If we listen to what Hopestone is saying, um, some of the multilateral funding will have the opposite impact rather than the right impact. Um, and, and, and companies are trying to shed debt as well. Um, so when we look at adaptation for the future, where should businesses focus? Um, where should countries focus? That to me is a fascinating question. Um, Herman, I'm gonna bring you in on this one. You, you're seeing companies moving to a low touch environment. Um, that's obviously a response to the pandemic, but, but where do you see future business models going so that companies survive? You spoke about consolidation, um, yep. but where would countries be in three years from now? I mean, the first thing that's going to happen, I think, is uh, the, the bigger companies are going to start to dispose of non-core assets. So that's going to create a lot more smaller companies. Um, that's the one thing that's going to happen. I think you're going to see a lot more move from high-touch, low-tech to low-touch, high-tech, um, and so, you know, in education, we've already seen it, but you're going to see it more in, in um, for example, um, in, in, in entertainment, um, uh, financial services. I think you're going to see a big move down market. So a lot more sachet type business, bottom of the pyramid stuff, micro lending, for example. I think we, we will see a lot more of that where the, it's going to be um, a lot more cashless. The money will be dispensed cashlessly. It will be repaid cashlessly. It will be spent cashlessly. It'll be banked cashless. I think you're going to see a massive acceleration in microtransactions, micro lending, and and mobile money. Certainly, no more dollar debt. I think you, you, you you're going to see a hollowing out in terms of assets. I don't think you, you're going to find property playing such a big role because there's really no funding available for that. So a lot of the corporate offices that you've seen will disappear. You've seen Jumia. I think I think Jumia. Uh, so a 10% drop in revenue, and mainly it was because of an inability to deliver. There was definitely the market for online commerce has grown, and in particular, online purchase of services will grow. I think you're going to see a big move towards localization. So where things were being purchased and imported, take PPE, for example, uh, you're going to find a lot more manufacturing of that locally. And then, of course, I think, I think that you'll see... A lot of people in Africa delivering services offshore electronically. I'm already seeing this in my business. We're in a, a part of the world where we actually low cost. We have a low cost currency and we're able to deliver services all over the world cheaply. So I think those, those are just some of the things that are playing around now. Herman, I mean, thanks a lot. Um, um, Alison Gilwald from ICT has got a very interesting comment here on the sidebar. She says that research ICT Africa um, from early evidence, particularly under the lockdown, saw that um, where you have low levels of digital access and Rwanda is quite low and usage, the informal sector um, has not been um, that able to mitigate the effects. Um, and, and you've had ruptures in the informal value chain and labor supply. Um, I mean, that's one of the things highlighted in the report as well. Um, yeah, could you want to come in on that? I mean, this ability of the informal sector to respond um, if it's not digitally well connected. Um, is that motivating the massive drive in Rwanda for digitalization of the economy and rolling out? Thank you, Henny. Uh, that's a very important question indeed. Um, yes, uh, most African countries have, uh, as I said, 
uh, large informal sectors. Uh, and what we've seen in different um, economies, they are, they are really digitizing or digitalizing, uh, digitizing first, most of the value chains, most of the sectors to ensure yes. that they are, they are more resilient. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and in Rwanda particularly, I mean, it's, it's very critical that we, I mean, we, we understand where we are coming from and where we are and where we are heading to. This cashless agenda that we have and the national strategy for transformation really uh, made in Rwanda policy are driving such kind of uh, aspects. And, and that is very important indeed. Uh, I mean, government has moved most of the services uh, on or online. And really in this particular period of COVID, people would get their services from government on an online platform. So that's, uh, I think, being the private sector and the public sector, I think digitization and digitalization is quite key. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, um, Yaku. Judith, uh, you've been active in the sidebar. I can, I can see that. Um, uh, this, this, this question raised by Dubel about the aggregation of debt and creating funds to, to take that up and, and give some, some breathing space. Um, and then how that is linked to, um, to some of what I think are, or, or observing are accelerating um, um, public concerns. I was, I was interested to see that the French government, when they granted Air France um, um, a, a lifeline to, to continue, um, one of the points they made is if, where there's regional um, flights, if there's a train alternative, those should be removed. But that's a real environmental condition being brought into the debt market here, um, but closely linked to COVID. Some of your responses to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's quite interesting about whether there's going to be, you know, there's some talk around, um, sort of optimistic talk about maybe this will be the, the change that we needed as a sort of, you know, yeah. global economy uh, to rethink the structure, and particularly, of course, around climate change, where, yeah. uh, as I mentioned in Sandbar, you know, it's something where we're all ex uh, exposed and COVID in a way has highlighted that, you know, uh, advanced economies can't ring fence themselves off from these problems that, mm. that, that you know, they, they need to think, think, um, think, uh, globally as well and I would certainly like to think that's something that we could you know promote as, as one of the outcomes we'd like to see uh, um, in terms of that type of more holistic thinking. Um, yeah. I think though there's also some negative thoughts and particularly of course people be aware that there's a, a, a you know a, lot, a, a rise of nationalist governments um, in Europe and of course in the US um, where um, you know putting up the wall uh, has been uh, sort of physically and metaphorically has been uh, an approach and um, I think too, of course, uh, governments in advanced economies are themselves very fiscally strained because of the huge responses. So it's good mm -hmm. from an economic perspective, but of course it may make them less generous um, in the longer term. I think though, um, you know, to your question about, you know, what can, what can we, what can Africa do? I think they need to think about some of the you know, longer term about some of the national um, economic strategies and particularly, you know, there are opportunities in things like uh, greater regionalization of economies, which, you know, reduce the, the yeah. dependence yeah. on international yeah. events, uh, the deepening of domestic financial systems, again, to reduce the, the kind of problems that we're seeing in, um, you know, financing from international capital markets. And personally, I'm, I'm very optimistic about digital digitalization as well. Um, you know, it's not only something that uh, helps you in a pandemic, but of course it creates enormous efficiency and productivity gains it in does. economies. And it's something where Africa has been very much at the forefront. They've let, leap, mm -hmm. you know, let frog uh, in terms of technologies and we've had huge uptake. I know there are places where there's still pockets without um, connectivity, but just the, some of the innovations we're seeing what was mobile money, but is now becoming mobile, you know, businesses, trade, opportunities, yeah, yes, services. Yes. I think there's a big potential there. So they maybe um, uh, there needs to be thinking about how to diversify and uh, create resilience within the economy as part of a sort of central part of uh, um, national strategies. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Judith. Hoekstown, last question to you. Um, it was interesting, Yaku, right at the beginning, when he started his response, spoke about the, um, the strength and the quality of institutions um, in public institutions in country to respond. You mentioned it in your, um, in, in your contribution. So when we have this additional pressure being placed 
on public finances, on public institutions in Africa, will the COVID pandemic lead to a deterioration or an improvement in governance in Africa, which has been something that have challenged us for quite a while? Uh, Hoxton, thank just checking you. Yes, th thank you, Hans. Thank you, thank you for that question. Very interesting. Will that we, we don't want to be negative on the African continent. We'll rise up back stronger and bigger. That's that's yes. that's the, the belief. That's the belief that we have. Um yeah. the, the, the COVID nineteen actually what it has done is actually to 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 to, to it's like a wake up call for most of the African institutions or most of yeah. the African countries. One thing is that you will see that the situation has mostly been exacerbated by our dependence on the global economy as we yeah. export most of the commodities, as most of the colleagues have indicated. Uh, most of uh, the, the, the problems that are, fa are facing the, most of the African countries is actually because we are, we are commodity dependent on, the, on, on exports that we don't even process, which cause the, 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 the issue of structural transformation and, the, and diversification in African economies, as, as Judith has indicated. That is uh, one of the issues that the African uh, Union Commission through the Agenda 2063, as well as the Global Agenda 2030, they put emphasis on. We believe that uh, this, uh, this actually also put uh, a lot of emphasis on the issue of institutions that African countries uh, should, uh, should come up with, especially in relation mostly to the public finance management uh, in, in this institution. And most of the countries, even as of now, are putting up initiatives uh, that actually are, are expected to revamp such kind of institutions in order to make a specific and important use of the funds that the African countries are actually receiving now. Having said that, uh, also related to what, uh, what Judith has indicated, is the issue of the CFTA, where this is the continental free trade area. This is one of the, the big things mm. on the continent as of now. And the, to, to, to make sure we, 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 we make use of our structural transformation progress, as well as the diversification of our economies, uh, there will be a big market uh, for African commodities, African products within the continent, which is uh, the most specific aim of the continental free trade area. Uh, hence yeah. promoting lives and livelihoods so the implementation, the successful implementation and effectiveness of the continental free trade area will play a significant role uh, in that particular regard. Thank you. Right. Hopeson, thank you very much. Um, so a lot of hope indeed, um, and I agree with you, we, we're rising and we're seeing very positive responses and more long-term thinking in a variety of places. Um, uh, I want to actually end with, um, with a great question asked by Ross Nathan in the panel. He said, is there a prediction of some kind of renaissance for self-sufficiency, local production and opportunity for the domestic market to thrive in every country? Now, we, that seems to be a question all for its own for, the, for a future discussion. And we'll probably put a final poll on now just for people to indicate whether they're interested to continue this type of discussion. But a particular thank you to, to our panel, to, um, to Herman, to Hopestone, to Iaku and to Judith for bringing different dimensions of these um, three drivers, our exposure to the external sector, the fiscal space and the borrowing space of our economies and the inherent resilience of the economies. All of those are driving in different configurations how Africa is responding, um, and in many cases, very positive. So thank you to the three of you, sorry, to the, to the four of you for bringing those perspectives. Thank you to Christine Hochart and the Senfri team for putting this together. You'll find the, the note um, on the, um, on the Senfri website. It's also being um, distributed through social media. But this dis discussion, I think, is, it's begun, but it's long from over. And we look forward, I think, of all of us in our organizations to engage with that. Thank you very much for joining us um, this afternoon or morning if you're on the other side of the planet. Have a good afternoon. Goodbye for now. Thank you very much, Shen. Bye now. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.